that it makes me think about in terms of like reimagining blackness is just that that it show well in terms of horror it it just kind of reminds me that it's a lot of the same issues that are there that are in i mean like many types of um storytelling and, and a lot of it just has to do with representation having control of the um having control of the the um the material being able to put it out there produce it and having and being able to, to see ourselves but also have them visualize have ourselves visualized in ways that are um authentic or or diverse right so um we only have i have other things i would say about that but it's so it's so short um the time that we we have so um first i just want to kind of open it up to to see if anybody has any questions or comments that they want to say about the documentary it's like uh jordan hey y'all um yeah, I mean, I, I found it very interesting. I mean, I put it in the chat really early on, but, you know, do we think that, like, film can do, like, what can it and can't it do? Like, what can it communicate? Because the, the thing that's just running through my mind is just, and I, I know we were talking about this in the chat, but I don't know, I, I'm thinking of Terrence Nash. I'm thinking of Random Acts of Flyness, where, you know, Terrence Nash is a very, you know, intelligent and creative individual, but one of the main conflicts of that show is this question of whether or not blackness can be represented by itself, or if it always have to be always has to be represented either in defense of itself or in relation to whiteness. And I think for this task of reimagining blackness, it's hard to use film's language when it's constantly always referring back to whiteness. That a, a true like black film would have to be one which redefines the entirety of the cinematic language it would have to take from a different culture entirely it couldn't refer back to hollywood at all which is funny because invisible man refers to it in, in its opening pages so it's just i think that kind of a black cinema or black cinema cinematic trajectory would have to be one which you can't call cinema and that's that's something what i think arthur jaff is doing with his work where you can't really call that cinema in a conventional sense but I don't know if a conventional cinema, even like something like Get Out or even something like Us, can really get at when it's still predicated by this relationship to whiteness. I was wondering what, what y'all were thinking about that. Yeah, I don't I don't know if. Oh, yeah, I don't. In in the way that you described it, I think I, I, I think it's it's almost too complete for me. Like, I mean, because I think that um, in, in the way that you're saying uh Black cinema would also, it wouldn't just not be film like you're describing. It would not be black cinema. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I mean, so, so that, so, so I guess talking about it in completes like that does, I mean, in, in that complete of a way, I don't, I don't know if it works like that. I mean, I think, think, um, if we define blackness, right, then we can, if, I mean, if we try to attempt to define blackness and we make work about that, it, it will be in relation to whiteness. So the only way that you can make work about it is this, this entity that we kind of, Talk about like that, and then in that we can um, create work that's about blackness and about our real experiences, right? So, um, and I think one of the things I said before is like you talking about like the grammar um, of of uh, of film, and uh, and and like I said, that that grammar is not it's not fixed, it's not static. We add to it, we change it, and it's not about the grammar itself. Those are just elements, like pieces that you use. Um, it's really about uh, what you say with it, and 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 you know, and that's limited by our access. Um, and, and 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 I guess the thing is, this kind of showed multiple ways. There's like who's directing it, who's starring in it, and then there's also about like um, the import importance of the characters and their roles and how they're handled. There's, I mean, all of those things. Like one of those things at a time could happen, you know, or all of them, you know. So. So um, I think that when it gets interesting is when all of those things happen. Um, I I think you're I think you're right. Um, both MacArthur and Jordan. Um, I think that it. So when it comes to film and it's a grammar, I think that it is full of possibility. Um, and it's full of possibility in ways that we can't put our fingers on or or box in because 
uh, it is a creative enterprise and it's going to change over time and the culture that that produces it will change over time. Uh, at the same time, there is a foreclosure that comes into play when we start talking about a black film. I can imagine a film that is constituted entirely by black people that makes no commentary on race. I can imagine that. Um, but then I don't know if it will be a black film. It will be a film with black folks in it. What makes a film black, right? I think is uh, it's this articulation and relationship, not necessarily to whiteness, uh, but it's understanding of its structural position, um, both in terms of the film industry and in terms of the symbols that take on meaning within the film itself. Um, so yeah, I, I think there is possibility in film, and I think we see we see a lot of that possibility, um, and and hence. Uh, and in small pieces, but uh, is it capable of doing the thing of helping us to completely reimagine blackness? Probably not, because for, for precisely the reasons that you name, uh, we produce it out of the culture that has already implicated blackness as everything that is that is bad and evil and grotesque. Uh, and so we do constantly produce art that reaffirms our beauty and our humanity. Um, and that's a that itself is a project against a call calling out of us as not having those things or being those things. Yeah. I think that I don't know, maybe I'm on maybe I'm saying similar to what y'all are saying, but maybe not. I think that other genres of film get closer to this idea of reimagining blackness as opposed to the horror genre. I think that horror always is going to be a response to whiteness because even with the get out that i like it I, I, if for those who don't know i just recently watched it for the first time in preparation for today but i like get out um but i don't think that because when i think about black cinema or black film even though it's created within just kind of like the institution of you know the media industry and hollywood and all that but if we think about films like, you know, Best Men and um, The Wood or any of those kind of films. To me, those are Black films, and I don't remember any or many, you know, white people in those. And so I think that, and, and that goes back, and I'm glad that you asked the question on camera, Jordan, because I know, like, for the recording, people won't have access to the, the chat. But for me, I think that other genres, you know, I guess, like I said, lend themselves more to us being able to imagine a world where we think about blackness or reimagine blackness outside of its relationship to whiteness. And I think we're able to get more to the that kind of intercommunal um, conversation, similar to like what we were having in the chat, where we were talking about the issues with Spike Lee. So then if we have like, that type of black cinema, it's going to be other conversations that we're going to have to have. So now we're talking about, you know, the misogyny or the misogynoir that's there. We're talking about the ableism. We're talking about the homophobia. We're talking about these other marginalizing dynamics and not necessarily race, but maybe colorism, I would say. So I don't know. Still thinking. Uh, I, I don't have my ideas all completely, but but um, the, it's in. So you mentioned like movies like Best Man, and then I'll probably add a whole bunch of other movies in there. I don't know if Love Jones would fit, and, and there's a whole group of of movies. That, and I love those movies, but I think that it's also difficult to talk about them as if they're not responses to whiteness too. Um, and then I think also even if they even if they don't have sort of obvious, um, if if they don't have have some something where they're sort of obviously responding in some type of way to to uh, uh, things that deal with racism and things we might deal on a day to day basis. Um, that is a part of our life, you know, it, and that would be a those are authentic tellings as well. But, you know, because I'm thinking I'm thinking about all of these movies, especially you can see the ones where where everybody has everybody drives up with a Mercedes Benz. I'm talking about the black movies now. They, everybody drives up with a Mercedes Benz. They're all dressed. They have good jobs, but they're not really they're not really working hard. You know what I'm saying? It's like that kind of thing. Everybody that is also a response to, you know, to actually that's a response to those same representations of us being represented as as, as pimps and, you know, and on the street and drug addicts and these other ways. And it's like, okay, we want we want that respectable image of us. 
that's here too. I mean, I think so. I think having that that range of diversity, diversity, the the ugly, the beautiful, all of it is is um that's and and I guess that's the thing. We get these reproductions, you know, and 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 when when we have a uh, much more variety, I think that's that's when we. I don't know if it kind of reaches to what you're saying, Jordan, but I think that's when we have a a, a more um sort of uh. I don't know if I want to say realistic, but um, but I think it's important to 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 not. I think the other things reproduce stereotypes and tropes, um, whereas that can that helps to break that down and it can show blackness in a variety of ways. Absolutely, and I'll say real quick, MacArthur, thank you for that. Um, like distinguishing the fact that yeah, those movies still are responding to whiteness, but I think for me, even even though I do think that that's true. Not having them on the screen is what I appreciate. So like not like having a movie like mm. Best Man or like those ones and not having to like we know that it's there just because that's how our lives are, but not us having to engage, you know what I mean? Cause that's mm. labor. Can kind of go yep. back to like Rachel True was saying in terms of like always being in service, you know? And to me, it does seem a little bit, you know, like I guess aspirational or fictitious, because like you said, that's not like I don't know, like all of my friends don't drive a Mercedes and we're not, you know, we're working hard out here. So <laughs> I don't know. David and Jordan, y'all oh. hands raised. Oh. Oh, I can go first. Um, yes, I, I just wanted, one, two, two things I wanted to sort of bring up were, um, I, I guess three things. So one of, one of the, the first things is, is like, I would like to sort of see if we can like, I don't want to say agree on conceptually, but at least give our own perspective and what we think it means to define blackness. Because like, as I was saying in the chat, I was like, for me, I don't know if, and this is, this is sort of my own response to like more Moten more than anyone, is I don't know how much an imaginative project is really possible. Uh, under the conditions that blackness is under. And so that's why I find the Afro-pessimist account more useful. Now, this is to say, this, at the same time, I, I don't want to call myself an Afro-pessimist. I have very, you know, specific distinctions that I would like to make in my own work. Um, but I, I do think following Marriott's reading of, like, Fanon and this idea that, like, blackness is this kind of ontologically void object, right, that the work then in this sort of void of the zone of non-being is to disrupt the very conditions of the aesthetic, right? I don't want to be called beautiful. I don't want beauty to exist, right? I don't want there to be a value judgment that could call me beautiful and call someone else ugly, right? I think the very idea of an ontological value judgment, which makes these distinctions, is the problem. So for me, a kind of black cinema and in my own work of a black literature would have to be a work which is trying to change the game conceptually. Right, which is trying to say that these very conceptions of what we value in art and aesthetics are all wrong and that an entirely new system has to be supposed. So that's the first question. I just I, I wonder if not if we can all agree, because obviously we're coming from very different backgrounds. We don't think of the blackness differently, but I'm interested in what you all think, you know, it means to define blackness. And these are two shorter questions, but I'm personally working on my own horror film right now. Uh, hopefully it'll be done by December and there won't be any like people in it. It's kind of trying to do that whole abstract thing that Arthur Jaffe is trying to do. But what I'm trying to get at is that this relationship that blackness has to horror and objection is not one which has to always be seen in the face of the monster or the other, but it is a condition that shackles blackness plainly, right? That's what I'm trying to get at is the very expression of what it means to be alive during social death, right? And that's what horror can sort of represent are these fundamental concepts to what it means to be alive and black in the 21st century. Um, the final sort of note I have is that there's a song, and I'll put it in the chat uh, by this guy, Bongo Joe, called Transistor Radio. And um, I, I, I like to imagine it as a kind of Afrofuturist song. Um, it, it's basically a song where there's this main character and he has his revolver with him and he's going to all these people, all these like uh, authority figures in the world, and he's asking for their transistor radios, right? And it's this, I think it's a kind of Afrofuturist project. But what I mean by it is, is going off what Dr. Searles was saying is this idea of like what it means to imagine via the aesthetic a world in which blackness is possible. Uh, and I do think that that kind of world is possible. And I think that songs like that kind of do it. But I am 
curious what it would mean to chart out a world like that and 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 when we don't live in a world like that right is that is the very pro project of charting out that kind of afro futurist future one which is always liberatory or is it one that is always imaginative right that can never be reached that under the certain conditions we're in what we're really after is just whiteness uh, i know that's a lot but <laughs> those are some of the things that i'm trying to to think through in my own work um, I'll jump in first to uh, for the first um, provocation. That's what I'll call it um, on <laughs> on blackness um, because my understanding of my understanding and use of Afro pessimism I think is a little just slightly different from your articulation of it. Um, from my reading of folks like Wilderson and Jared Sexton and folks who don't call themselves Afro pessimists but who speak to the the tradition as it is becoming. Um, my understanding is not that it is a claim about blackness, it's not an ontological claim about blackness. It is not that blackness is in fact negation. It is rather a claim about ontology and it's the claim that ontology itself is political. So within the political ontology of this world, blackness is negation, but this world isn't the only world that exists and it's not the only world that is possible. Um, and so when you talk about in, in your second provocation, the film that you're working on, I think this is precisely an example of the the kind the ways that Afro pessimism doesn't have to be a dead end. Um, in, in some ways, it seems as if it has opened up your your mind to think about uh, the various ways that we represent in the world and the value judgments that we place upon those representations. And um, and so you are attempting to imagine and also create uh, and visualize a world in which the, the things that we consider uh, valuable by way of aesthetics uh, no longer have to hold that kind of meaning, that they don't have to carry with them both the weight of forcing us to aspire to a thing or to desire a thing uh, while they also negate the things other. Um, that's what I see as the sort of the promise. now. Afro pessimism does what it doesn't do is tell us how to get there, uh, right? It, it it just provides the apparatus for understanding that the grammars that we work with, the metaphysical tools that we have, the disciplinary practices that we engage in, especially in academia, that these things are not the tools that we can use to do the work of imagining a black world or a world that is black in a way that doesn't um, that doesn't refer to the ontology of this world. Um, so I, I think there is opening there, but it's it's folks like you and MacArthur, the artists in the room, who have to help us get to the next point. Because the academics, we're still stuck over here. <laughs> okay. True. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just agreeing with what Professor Ponton said. What were you about to say? Oh, you muted. I'm sorry. No, I, I said I, I was just going to respond to the provocation, but it but I thought you were going to go first. <laughs> so no, I actually wanted to get the second one again, so I'm going to go ahead and let you respond and then have Jordan repeat that second one because I'm still like, OK, now I got the first one, but what was the second one again? So, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm not sure. if I'm oh, So I remember one of the things that you were talking about, like, how do we how do we define blackness? Right. Um, so. And and I think one of the things I, I point out, I guess for me, when I think about blackness, it's not a, it's I don't I don't um, see it as 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 all bad, right? Like that it's all the bad things and all the all the all the negative representations that you can bring to blackness. Um, I see it as as um, a a perception of what black. I mean, the perceptions of what blackness is, which includes um, which includes a lot of bad. <laughs> you know, and um, this projected on us and has been passed on through to, uh, through over time, but it's also a lot of good as well. Um, and um, so, so, so um, in the same way that I think in the same way that um, we've been monsterized and, and blackness is, has been described as ugly, I think that exists right alongside the idea of 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 thinking of it as beautiful and the other types of complexity that we might have and and the things that we've created i think we've created a lot of black people have created 
a lot of things, invented a lot of things. They have, I mean, um, and contributed um, broadly to, I mean, within the culture and and out that in in ways that are 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 um, uh, uh, numerous. So, um, so, but then there's this idea of of sort of uh, like you, you're talking about, like not being, not wanting to be in a realm where we're talking about like sort of being beautiful or I guess even ugly in that case. Um, but I think that at that point we are we're talking about not having value, right? Like I think especially when we're talking about aesthetics, aesthetics require value, right? Um, so, but the thing that's interesting is that people have different values and values change. Black people, not as a not just generally, but yes, black people have different values than than other people as well. And for that reason, that allow I, I guess in my mind that allows us to have an aesthetic, and it doesn't have to be. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't use some of the grammar and conventions that come um, from other people because they use ours as well. Um, but but it does mean that. Um, but it does mean that we can have particular values, and I think that's where when we're talking about like even like with black horror um, or any. Films in in a, in a way we can we can we can start to have stories and characters and ways of representing things that resonate with us. I don't know if you wanted to go first, Dr. Plumpton, but I can repeat my my question for Dr. Charles. No, let's let Dr. Plumpton go. <laughs> um. Well, what I what I want to say actually, um, I think is is a question for you, um, Dr. Searles, because um, you might be able to to help me think through this. So, um, so I, I was thinking back to Jordan's comment about um, about reading David Marriott and his reading of France Fanon, and one of the things that has stayed with me since the first time I've read Marriott is um, his 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 question about whether it is possible to dream um, if our dreams are, are if, they've, if there's already been an incursion of our dreams by the nightmares that we are made to endure. How can we know that what we're dreaming is not a product of this, uh, this external force? And that, as I sat here thinking about Jordan's comments a bit more, it made me think back to your work in the erotic. Um, it, it, could the erotic be a way to theorize um, something that exceeds the incursion of this world on our dreaming? Could what does the erotic do in your work, and and what maybe can it help us do that uh, maybe recourse to aesthetics don't do? Because um, at least in in our reading of Kevin Kwashi, um, the erotic. Uh, it, it tears apart what we assume to be a fissure between the interior and the exterior, such that um, we are able to, we, we come to know through what we feel rather than what we are taught or rather than how we are disciplined. Um, so I'm curious, what, what, are you, what are your thoughts about where the erotic might fit into this conversation of dreaming of, uh, or of imagining something else? That's a really good question. It's almost like you're in my mind because I was thinking about the erotic when you all were talking and trying to figure out how it would factor into the conversation. And so I think that and I'm still, you know, learning and thinking through all of the uses of the erotic, you know, and people are still contributing to to Lord's work in that way. But so there's so the erotic outside of the sexual use, of course, can deal with like the ways that energy is exchanged. And so when we think about energies and when we think about our responses to those energies, our responses to like our senses and engaging our senses, I think that that might be an area to kind of delve into. So those things that, you know, make us laugh, make us cry. So like, why is it that with particular films, and if we're thinking specifically about horror, that, you know, some people found Get Out to be places in, in Get Out to be humorous or places to, you know, that were not meant to be funny, but you know what I mean? So I think that thinking about like the different kind of emotions that certain 
media provoke or like literature or whatever provoke can kind of maybe start to be an entryway to see, help us see how the erotic can help us start doing the work of reimagining. But of course, I know it would have to go beyond that. But I think that that's kind of where it lies, kind of kind of taking a look at the like visceral responses and the emotional responses that different works can invoke in us and then follow that to, I guess, whatever this dream or whatever this imaginative kind of realm kind of leads us. But I do think that it probably should be more of a starting point than what, you know, especially we in academia tend to think that it would be. I think that now more than ever, we should be having the conversation about, you know, how that type of erotic knowledge factors into um, our understanding and factors into kind of our consciousness, just because we've dealt with so much like subjugation and so much harm and like oppression and marginalization that if not for the erotic, we can't, we won't be able to imagine something new. You know, it's like, we're going to always be bogged down in the histories of the past. So I don't know. That's a really good question that I think once we do like our next seminar and even into next semester, I'm still going to be trying to kind of formulate. So yeah. Jordan. Um, no, yeah, I mean, I've also been trying to think of the erotic, but not from Lord, um, from this uh, French philosopher, Georges Bataille. My light is blocking it completely. Um, but um, one of the things that I've been thinking about is that well, there's two things. Is one that I think perhaps the very relation that we have to the erotic is one which is always unclear, right? So it's it's this relation like following like Freud's reading of like the erotic is that Perhaps the only, like, when he's talking about fetishes, he basically goes to this biological account and he goes to the symbolic account. And he's like, well, it has to be some combination of the two. But to do an analysis of the symbolic relations of the fetish seems impossible, right? And I think one can read this as being the truth of the equation, right? Is that the only way in which the fetish, the, the, like, the fetish's response works is that it is always unclear, right? Is the erotic's response to, to what I'm calling affectual textures is always an unclear relation. At the moment in which we circumscribe it and we say, well, this is how it, it functions, we lose it entirely, right? So it's that we're always sleepwalking, right? We're always in the state of, of, of symbolism that we can't ever know our conscious completely. And so we can't ever get at what creates these affectual textures, but only we can only enact them, right? We can only create, we have to work you know, via this creative erotic mode, right? And so I'm trying to think through that, but at the same time, I, I'm i worried that, again, like on this very basic level, that perhaps, again, a, an imaginative project isn't possible because we are conditioned by a world that we can't ever know, right? Um, that is always foreign to us, and that even outside of, the question of blackness, right, on an ontological or metaphysical level, right, following someone like Heidegger or Derrida, right, that the world doesn't seem to want to reveal itself to us, right, that the system of this world seems impossible, right, seems impossible to understand. And so the project then of, of, a, of, a, of a black of black work, and this is the work that Fanon's trying to think through via his, his concept of new humanism, is that you would have to restructure the world completely. You would have to just create a new fundamental structure of everything. And it's like, can aesthetics help us imagine that? I like to think they can, but I don't know. <laughs> I think the best aesthetics can kind of do is just kind of break the wall, you know, is like how Nietzsche talks about philosophizing with hammers and, and dynamite. Like maybe that's what black aesthetics can do. But I don't know if it's possible to create a new world with this language that we have. But I don't know, that's just me. <laughs> Type the name of the book in the chat, Jordan. I mean, my, my response to that is, um, well, one, I didn't know that I could ever meet someone who was more pessimistic than me. Um, <laughs> but um, I, when, I, when I think about Dr. Searles' work with the erotic um, and this and knowing by way of feeling rather than knowing by way of of sort of metaphysical apprehension of the world 
uh, that that does seem to open up more possibility for me because uh, the language we have is language we have. The grammars that we that we are stuck in are the ones we are stuck in. But there are certain things that are, I think, beyond that, right? Um, I feel hunger, which is different from appetite, right? My appetite is aesthetic, but what I feel, that's something, that's something a lot more, that's something at the base of, right? And I feel a need for love, but the, but whatever form that love takes is informed by the culture. So there, there is something that is there, um, right? Which, which gets back to Sylvia Winter and the sociogenic principle, right? There, there's something that's there at the level of matter, at the level of biology that exceeds um, that exceeds culture, that that precedes history as a discipline, uh, as a, as a, as the construction of knowledge about the past and the present, um, and that's the thing that I that I want to learn how to get a hold of. Um, I'm not going to learn how to get a hold of it through my work because I'm a historian, and <laughs> but I probably can get a hold of it through the work of folks like you all who are in literature and art um, because there's. In some ways, you're you have the capacity to to work in anti-disciplinary ways that still constrain a lot of the ways that I that I approach thinking, which is probably why I am so pessimistic. Um, but it but it heartens me to know that there are folks out there who can do the work of reaching down into the sort of the deepest part of whatever people want to call it. You can call it the soul, or you can just call it being um, with a capital B. That, that, that it's possible to see hints of it and to hold on to it as, as strongly as we can and produce ways of seeing the world differently or imagining a world that could be different. And I think it's the could be, it's always the subjunctive that plays the powerful role in, in these kinds of moments. The subjunctive, which allows in some ways like historians, um, and I'm thinking of Saidiya Hartman, who. I count as a historian um, allows us to um, to imagine what is lost uh, in the archive and in the past, what we can't touch, see, or feel, what we might call the interior. Um, but be, but we can do that. We can use a subjunctive to play games with with the archive because uh, because we have that the ability to to call out those questions within ourselves. And that ability comes from our knowing that other folks like have hunger too, that other folks want love too, that other folks feel a need for community as well. Um, that that thing that is at the base of us also exceeds us. Uh, and, and in exceeding us exceeds the cultures in which we're produced. I've never thought those thoughts before. This has been more more provocative than I've ever thought it could be. But but I'm done talking for now. <laughs> I want to get, if you don't mind, uh, regardless, is your take on. I'm thinking specifically about inspiration. And Jordan, I see your hand. Don't forget your comment. But I'm thinking about like the role of inspiration and like the root of inspiration being like you know spirit. And then I'm thinking about kind of okay capital S spirit, but like, how does just the role of the artist factor into this idea of dreaming or reimagining uh, blackness or world making and all of that that we kind of discussed thus far? I know it's a huge question. I, I, I was going to say that does sound like a big question. Um, how does the role of the artist factor into? Hold on, let me let me try and put it in, in a question I can I could probably answer. Maybe like, how does the role of the artist fit into um, the the ability to the ability to imagine this new world, or to to, to imagine a, a, um, a black world? We we'll put it that way. Is is that what you're asking? What I'm asking because I'm thinking like, if I were an artist, like how where would I even start? Like if I wanted to enter into this work. So I'm just trying to get into the mind of an artist, I guess. Yeah, I mean, um, so I think that, okay, so um, there are, I think for, for basically kind of like what you were saying, David, I mean, there's, uh, or maybe you were, I don't know if you're saying this or not. I mean, um, just as people, there are things that we, we of course, we feel is specific that, that is, that goes beyond, that goes beyond words and established structures, right? 
Um, but and then we we use language. I mean, we use forms. I won't say say language. We use well, we use forms or mediums to be able to c- communicate. So I think that that we that we have space to play, and um, we have space to play and invent and test and stumble upon things. Um, and usually. For, I mean, for me as an artist, and that because I can't speak for everyone as 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 well. I mean, I think that that um and and but I can't say for many artists, we do find our ways through through um through what feels right. Like it's done when it feels right. It's um um I'll put it out in the world when when it makes sense to me, right? In a way, and and that's so a lot of times people say, well, when is this done? Right. And it, there is no sort of specific like, oh, it's done when I put this brushstroke on. It is it, it is really about when it when it has the right resonance, when it has the right um, sort of expression. And um, that allows that allows you I guess I feel like that allows you to kind of get beyond words in some ways and that and sort, or sort of vernacular. Right. But then um, but I think. I don't know if this is this is kind of along with your question or not. I mean, I was and maybe it's going off in a different direction. I was thinking one of the things things when we were talking about utopias before, because um, it doesn't have to be a utopia, right? But one of the things we were talking about with utopias before was that that um, um, or at least I was thinking that if we can, there's we can whether whether you whether we say we you say we can't imagine um. Now, let me back up. When we're talking about utopias, I'm thinking that if nothing else, we can at least dream about, um, we could all, um, at least dream about a space or have fantasy about a space that is not is, that is not anti-Black, right? So, like, that doesn't necessarily have to be in, invaded by that. Now, um, that doesn't mean it's still not influenced, but in some ways we can do that and we can, and there's there's nothing keeping us from making that. There is nothing. I mean, so we can do that in, as long as we have the the tools, we can do that in film and in images and songs. And and I think there are attempts to do that. Um, it's another thing to have a discussion about it and bring it back. To, I mean, and and then connect these things again. Um, but but there's nothing there's nothing holding us back from from being able to make that expression. I love it. I put a comment in the chat. I think Jordan, uh, you might have the the last word. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness, the last word. Um, okay, so I there are two things. I'll be short. Um, I wanted to talk to to, to you, Dr. Ponton, specifically because when you're talking about this idea of love, um, it reminds me of something I've been trying to think of of, of basically trying what I'm calling a, being a thinker of relation, which is this idea that like the principle that one hat that one must manifest to affirm life has to be a, a principle of relation that I affirm life on the grounds that I am in life with others and others are what make life worth living, right? And so it's being able to ex- to inhabit a kind of proximity to the other, to the, to the true other, the kind of new humanism that Fanon's trying to think of that allows me to see the other in all their bounds, that doesn't, that I don't have to ground it in these identities of race, of gender, of sex, that I can simply encounter the other as they exist. And so that's something I'm going to con- tr- continue to try and think about and hopefully publish so that I can send it to you, because I, I think we're, we're kind of on the same track on, on thinking through a lot of these things. But as a, a final word, I want to talk a little bit about my own aesthetic practice. And for me, it's a practice of failure. You know, for me, trying to imagine these new worlds isn't something I'm going to get on my first or second or third or fourth try. Uh, I could define my work as a work which is constantly in the bounds of failure, but it is a model of generativity and decay. Right. Is that if I can at least at the very least generate concepts while I am failing or hopefully deteriorate what it means to write poetry or create film while I am making all this like this work of failure, then that for me is the project. Right. For me, I'm, I'm calling it a kind of decompositional aesthetics. Right. Is the ability of blackness to mobilize these ontological refusal refusals of all the values which have been handed to me in order to create a new kind of world in which I don't have to worry about any of these value systems. But yeah, I guess that's the last word. <laughs> that's awesome. fascinating. I look forward to continuing that conversation. Uh, Dr. Searles, it's, it's on you. <laughs> I'm going to 
to say, well, thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. The recording of the discussion will be up on our Humanities Institute page, and please be on the lookout for our upcoming seminars and events. Thank y'all. Thanks.